All right. Good morning. How was your week? Any chaos? You're laughing. <laughs> if you only knew, huh? Oh, it's been quite a week. I love the songs you picked. The they go with the sermon today, and I didn't really decide on this sermon until a few hours ago, so I don't know how you knew. The lesson you had in Sunday school about the nations and the Canaanites and where they came from, and that goes with what I'm doing today. I don't know how you knew. I told somebody that they were really enjoying, they said they were really enjoying the teaching, and, but more than that, how God seems to be meeting us here and putting this all together in a supernatural way, and I said, you know, it's like we're surfing on the, we caught this great wave, and we're surfing, and I don't know how long it's going to last, but we're going to ride this wave, okay, and enjoy every minute of it, so, um, but then it could turn, yeah, it's great, so anyway, uh, this week is called uh, Storms and Demons, um, next week is called uh, Healings and Wineskins, uh, Oh, I know. I know. God can do it. <laughs> Hard to pick songs. I, I'm uh, amazed. Jesus healed so many people in so many places, in so many ways, but the, there are specific healings recorded in the four Gospels. And I am discovering that they're recorded for a reason. They're not just healings that we read and say, oh, he healed a leper. Oh, he healed a blind man. Oh, he cast out a demon. They are specifically linking to other scriptures. The places have memory and are linking to other scriptures. The words Jesus used have meaning and are linking to other scriptures. And the whole purpose is people who, if their eyes are opened and their ears can hear and their hearts can understand, then they would have been there that day and they would have seen that healing and they, and they would have their eyes would have been open so that they could see Messiah. And their ears would be open so they could hear the words and, and, under, and obey them. And their hearts would be such that they could understand the words and walk them out. And it would change their lives. And those healings are not just, oh, that's a good story. Or I wonder why he did that. Or why did the demon say that? Start asking questions of the text. Because there's some amazing connections. And I never really saw the big picture uh, of the, the storm that Jesus calmed and then he ends up on the other side and then he confronts a demon and that big picture encompasses Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation and it sums up everything that God seemed to do through time and points to so many connections between Messiah implementing the power of God and God's power through time. And I don't know if I can break that down today. I don't know if I can do that, but we're going we're gonna to broach it. We're going to try. We're going to see where we go. So if you remember uh, last week, um, he, Jesus was uh, teaching, and the crowds got so big that he stepped into a boat, probably Peter's boat, and the they, they went a little ways out, and the acoustics are amazing on the Sea of Galilee. We were kayaking along, and we could hear people, it seemed like miles away, and hear their voice, but it, it was a distance away. And um, after he got done teaching, uh, he told the disciples, uh, you know, throw your nets out, and Master, we've fished all night and caught nothing, and we just cleaned our nets, and they're drying, and throw them. But because you said so, we'll do it. And they throw the nets out, and the nets are so full of fish, they're breaking, and the boats are sinking, and another boat comes, and they haul them in, and the disciples say, we're leaving everything. And then some other disciples come to him and say, Master, I would follow you, but I need to bury my father. I would follow you, but I want to say goodbye. I would follow you, but, and Jesus, we had a teaching on, what those things actually connected to and meant. Many of them referenced in the Old Testament through time. And right after that, they get in the boat and they take off. And they're headed for the other side. 
Okay, so the other side was an idiom for the Decapolis cities. On, let's see if we can come up with a picture here. On, I'm just going to go down to one I took here. This is up on a hill on the, um, get my east and west mixed up, on the west, east side of the Sea of Galilee. And on the west side, so the east side was all Jew and Gentile, Jew, Jewish. And on the west side was all pagan, Gentile Decapolis. No pigs on the east side, pigs on the west side. In fact, the archaeologists would go into, find an excavation, start digging, and if they didn't find any pig bones, what did they know? Jewish. If they found pig bones, what did they know? Gentile. Okay, so the Decapolis was made up of it's 10 cities. I think I've been to six of them. Uh, I haven't been to Damascus because it's up in Syria. Really not a good place to go right now. But um, Gadara and um, uh, Amman and Philadelphia and, and Jerush and uh, Synthophilus and, and some others that were scattered around. But where did these pagan cities come from? Well, they, the, the, the people, the sages said that they were made up of the seven nations that Joshua didn't defeat. So you were talking about that in your lesson this morning in Sunday school. Some of the Midianites, where did they come from? Moabites, Ammonites, all, as Tracy said, they all came from descendants of Abraham. It's one big family feud. And I remember my, my uh, wife, when she goes to Jerusalem, she just starts crying. There's something about the spiritualness of the place. I, I say, did you, did you, you sure you took your thyroid medication? Did, <laughs> did, did, uh, is this just some, a little jet lag? Here's some water, drink some water. And it's an emotional thing. And we walked into this little shop called Sh Shorshim. There's an old Jewish gentleman in there named Moshe. I, I tell stories about him occasionally. And she's still kind of crying, and he notices this, and they start talking. And she starts telling Moshe about the problems we're, she, we're having with some of our children. And that they won't get along, and they fight, and all these problems. And he says, you have the heart of God, because his heart is broken because his children don't get along either. And you know, you think about it. I think there's a, there's a big picture here. But... In Joshua, Moses dies, Joshua goes into the land, and they start conquering cities. But seven times it says they didn't completely drive out this one. They didn't completely drive out this one, this one. Or it mentions seven that were there. And they say that the seven relocated in the Decapolis cities. So that's where the Canaanites are. That's where the pagans are, the ones that were so evil that God said it's time Go in, kill them, drive them out. So this is the evil of the evil. And they wouldn't even say the word Decapolis. They would say the other side. The people that live in <clears throat> the other side. And so Jesus said, let's, let's go out to the other side. And the disciples would be looking at each other. John says to James, don't tell mom. <laughs> Do not tell anybody. We can't go over there. That's the other side. Besides that, we don't care about them. They raise pigs and they, they worship false gods and they have all these statues and fountains and things to the false gods and all of these despicable practices and we don't care about them. And so they head out to the other side. Jesus lays down in the bottom of the boat and falls asleep, and a storm comes. Um, and so what we have is three accounts. The first one in Matthew, they're, they're pretty close, but the one in Matthew happens early in the chronology. We're about midway through year one of Jesus' ministry. About midway through year two, Mark and Luke talk about a trip over to the other side. Matthew says they go over and they're met by two demoniacs. 
He doesn't give, say, how many pigs there were, nor how many demons, but other than that, the stories are pretty similar. Matthew has them going to a place called Gadara, to the Gadarenes. Mark and Luke have him going to a place called Gerasenes, the Gerasenes. The, the city of Gerish, or today Jerish, uh, was another huge Decapolis city, probably the biggest one. Gadara was a small one uh, close to the Sea of Galilee. Now it's possible because it, oh, it doesn't say they went to Gadara or they went to Gerasene, it says the region of. And so I guess the question might be, did this happen twice or are these just some irregularities in scripture? And I'm actually okay with either opinion um, because nothing really contradicts itself. There could have been two demon, demoniacs there in Mark and Luke, but one of them was named Legion. Uh, and other than that, and, and because it's a region of, but I think it happened twice. And for years, theologians have talked about this thing called the synoptic gospels. And they pull everything together that's similar and, and, and yet make comparisons to it, but kind of go with the idea that it only happened once. But to me, when I see something come together and they say it only happened once, but there's discrepancies, I start going, oh, and I know that two people could witness an accident out here and both tell the story of what they saw and it'd be slightly different. I get that. But when it comes to major differences, what's going on? And so I usually prefer, I lean towards two occurrences because in scripture, you cannot trust anything that isn't um, confirmed by two or three witnesses. So often Jesus will, or God, will, things will happen two or three times. Um, and we'll see that when we get into the healings. Oh, that happened here, it happened here, and it happened here. Oh, how many people were raised from the dead? The, the widow's son at Nain, the daughter of Jairus, and Lazarus. And boom, 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 witness, 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 witness. And so then you start to see the big picture. So I lean towards, we have two occurrences, but we're going to treat them as one today because they're so similar. Um, and Jesus is just emphasizing um, doubly emphasizing what's going on here, because it's really major. So he said, let's cross to the other side. Uh, this is a picture I took from Gadara. And if you look way down there, see, you see the Sea of Galilee. And the other side is where all the Jewish inhabitants are. I shouldn't use that word, the other side. The east side, okay? Over here on the west, the other side is where the ruins of all these uh, Decapolis cities. There's one called Susita, Kersi, Gadara, and then farther inland is Jerish. Um, and I, I remember the first time we went there, and Cheryl went, I went a second time, and Cheryl went that time. Both times we had a guide named Ahmed. And Ahmed met us at the border as we crossed from Israel into, the, into Jordan. And um, there's a lot of poverty in Jordan, so you can get a really nice personal tour cheaper than you can get a group tour in Israel. And so Ahmed met us, and uh, one of the, I think the first place we went was to Gadara. And I don't know if he'd ever been there before, because he had trouble finding it, because not very many tourists want to go to Gadara where the Gadarenes were from. But to me, it was just amazing because I could stand there and I could look and you could just put yourself in the place of these Decapolis people, these Gentiles, and look across. And word gets trickles over about the healings and about the miracles and about the disciples. And standing up here, you would have seen that storm. You would have wondered, those boats don't have a chance. Now, Matthew talks about their boat going, but Mark or Luke says there were other boats so there are other witnesses. That, I don't know if any of those, how many, how many shipwrecks were there that day? Because this was quite a storm. And so I love this place. But anyway, Ahmed um, was great. He, he uh, just a funny story. Uh, we were driving on the way to Gadara, and we went through these little towns. And after the third time, I saw a pen of sheep being sold along the street. It'd be like driving through a Malala, and there'd be a pen of sheep there. I said, Achman, what's with the sheep? And he goes, oh, I am going to have to buy one, maybe two, really soon. Well, why? Because when we have a baby boy and he's almost three and when he's weaned, 
I have to buy a sheep and, and feed the neighborhood. Because when Abraham, when Sarah weaned Isaac, Abraham killed a sheep and fed the neighborhood. And so we still do that to celebrate God's goodness of giving us a baby and weaning it. And, and so then that got me started uh, asking him, okay, you have a baby, tell me about your wife. Uh, first, I have a question. What about a bride price? Do, do, I mean, in the, since you're following the custom of Abraham, did you have to pay a price for this bride? Oh, I had to pay a very high price. Well, why, Ahmed? Because I found a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Muslim wife. And I had to work for like four years to earn the money to pay this bride price. And I said, well, tell me about the bride price. Does her father keep it in case you divorce her or leave her? And no, 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 no. She buys furniture for the house and jewelry for herself and things to put on to make herself beautiful. And all that money she gets to spend before the wedding. And then, after the wedding, I discover she dyed her hair blonde and she had contacts in to give herself blue eyes. <laughs> and he had to pay the high bride price. So culture is different on the other side. Um, but in the days of the master, uh, it was at the height of depravity in the Roman and Greek world and the temple prostitutes and the, all of the temples required sacrifices but they sacrificed pigs. And so when you see this herd of pigs wandering, they're the, probably, most likely the sacrificial pigs to the gods of the Canaanites. And I, I, Partway through my early years of teaching, I thought this was a Jewish area, and I thought it was okay for Jesus to destroy these pigs because Jewish people weren't supposed to be raising pigs. And that was my answer, but, you know, that just wasn't right because I didn't understand the culture and the geography and the location. So it turns out that the, um, the whole picture today is peace or chaos. In, um, in the days, uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew word for sea is yom. Okay, so they're on the yom going to the other side. Well, guess what the, Hebrew, the Canaanite, the name of the Canaanite god of the sea is? It's yom. Now, the Hebrew word for uh, death and destruction is mot. And guess what the name of the uh, brother of Yom is? It's Mot, and he is the god of chaos and destruction. And in the Canaanite world, you have Yom and Mot that are creating all this chaos for all the people. Everything wrong in the world is due to Yom and Mot. And Baal, Baal, Baal is the god of fertility and the god that will fight against Yom and Mot, and Baal will come down and make your crops grow and give you babies. But if you don't sacrifice and pray to Baal, then Yom and Mot will take over and there'll be chaos and destruction and your babies will die and your crops won't grow. And so the Jewish people, because it had the same name, C as Yom, they equated the ocean with demonic. And if you went down in that ocean, that was one of the gates to the underworld, to hell. And that's where the demons were. And that's where the source of chaos and destruction was. And so they're on this ocean, and there's, they're on Yom, and Mot is trying to destroy and kill them. Uh, and that's the picture we're in here. So let's read the text. If I could, let's go to Mark chapter 5. Lots of time. Okay, now on that day when uh, evening came, he said to them, and evening was uh, a term, Hebrew term would be about 3 in the afternoon. A little late to be starting over. 
I got the idea on Matthew on that episode, they went earlier. But this is a little late, they're headed out. Let's go to the other side. And so leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. Come just as you are. Have you heard that term? Did you know that originated in the Bible? Because that's a term for they left immediately. They let, come just as you are. And so it says that um, he was, uh, they took him along with them in the boat just as he was. Boom, they left. And then there arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus, Jesus himself was in the other gospels, say, the bottom of the boat. Mark puts him in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So here they are on Yom, the god of the sea, and Mot is trying to kill them. We are perishing. We are going to die. And he got up, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, hush, be still. Now, he could have just said, knock it off, or quiet, calm down. But he chose the words, and Mark, make sure we know them, hush, be still. And he rebuked them. Mark, make sure we know that he rebuked the wind and the sea. So he rebuked both the chaos and the god of the underworld, Yom, okay? He, this is a really big picture, is it not? Jesus is now taking on all the gods of the pagans, of the Canaanite nations, of the world, and we're going to see who prevails here. And he got up, rebuked the wind, the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now we could realize that we have some links here. Does, any, does anything pop in your mind that might be a parallel here from Old Testament? Kind of rack in your brain. Um, Jonah. Did you say Jonah, Michelle? You get, you get, the, you get the ice cream bar. Swans. Park your truck out here. I'm buying next week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this was supposed to be marking Jonah, but it came up Samuel. There we are. Okay. So if we were to start right out in the book of Jonah, boom, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city. Cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Okay, you see a little bit of go, wit, wickedness. So Jonah rose up to flee from Tar flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. They say, and, and I think that it's true, Nineveh was so wicked, they were um, torturing the children, skinning people alive. It was horrible depravity. And I think Jonah said, Lord, why don't you just go ahead and wipe them out? I just assumed they didn't repent. I don't really want to go there. And I don't really know if maybe the disciples were kind of thinking of that when he said, Go to the other side and, and maybe uh, Peter's rowing a little faster to kind of swerve the boat off a little bit because maybe they, maybe they don't really want to. I know they didn't want to go there, but I mean, this, they were still pretty new disciples. It's like, Mama's going to kill us. This is the end of it. Um, and Jesus falls asleep. They go, okay, row a little harder that way maybe. And then the storm comes. So when Jonah... Uh, was going to flee. He went down uh, into it uh, to go to Tarshish to flee the presence of the Lord. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. And then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and they threw the cargo from the ship and the sea and lightened it up. But Jonah had gone to the bottom of the ship. 
down, down below into the hold and lay down and was asleep. Gee, a little coincidence there, huh? So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. So you got yom, you got moat, die, chaos. And so the captain approached him and said, uh, oh, we read that. And each man said, uh, come, let us cast lots. You know the story. They finally decided it's got to be Jonah. Um, he explained that I'm fleeing from the presence of the Lord. You need to throw me over. The men didn't want to do it. Um, so they said to him, what should we do to you so that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rolled desperately to return to the land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier. They called upon the Lord, they prayed, uh, and then they picked up Jonah, threw him in the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord. Feared, they, that's how, what the disciples said. They were even more afraid greatly, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord, and then a Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. There's quite a connection there, quite an illusion there that Jesus is putting together. Okay, so we see that with Jonah, both were in a boat, both were overtaken by a storm, both storms were described exactly the same way, both were asleep in the bottom of the boat, both groups of sailors wake them up and say, we are going to perish. Divine intervention over nature occurs to calm the sea. How did the sea calm? God calmed the sea. Both groups were even more in fear and awe after the storm. In the Hebrew um, word for fear of the Lord, the sages discussed what the fear of the Lord meant. Was it just meant, I'm afraid of God, I don't want to be close to God? That's Because the, there's a lot of references to the fear of the Lord and keep his commandments, for this applies to every man. And we're, we're told to fear the Lord. And they said, well, that, that's uh, the lowest basic form of understanding God is just to be afraid of him. But the highest is, it's like when you see something that's truly, truly amazing and you start walking towards it because you've got to see what is going on there. Like Moses when he passed by the burning, the burning bush and he walked because he had to see and you know that God is amazing and you know there's something amazing going there and you have to get closer to it and you have to see it and you have to experience that's the fear of the Lord. And I think they had seen something pretty remarkable and I think both in the case of Jonah and in the case of the disciples they were in awe. I think that would be a better word, but they were still fearing the Lord. And so that's where we, we go. Um, we know from Psalms uh, 106.7, it's talking about um, the Israelites when they left Egypt and they got to the shore of the Red Sea. And remember, did they say, oh, we're free now, good job, Moses, or did they say, you brought us out here to die? We are doomed. Uh, Moses, we are going to perish next to the sea. So we have this picture of sea and perishing going on there. And the psalmist writes about that, and he says, thy wonders, they did not remember the, uh, our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders, they did not remember your abundant kindness, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for the sake of his name, that he might make his power known. Thus he rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up, and he led them through the deeps as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of the one who hated them, and he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy, the one that wanted to destroy them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. And then they believed the words and they sang a song to his praise. So I think the careful words that the gospel writers picked on how he rebuked the sea uh, links back to Pharaoh. And um, there'll be another episode that will happen that will link to Pharaoh and his armies drowning in the sea. Um, 
And then Psalms 107 tells us, it's, this is another psalm, and it's talking about sailors on the ocean that are caught in a storm. And the psalmist says, they reeled and they staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wit's end. And then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still, so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Jesus said, hush, and it was perfectly still. And they were glad because they were quiet, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. And so already we're connecting to Jonah, we're connecting to um, the exodus of Israel, we're connecting to storms in life and storms on the sea and near death. And all these things are in this narrative. We're also connecting to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, verse 2, and the earth was formless and void. I think we had this at the very beginning. Um, at creation, uh, that word for formless and void, we read that and we go, oh, there just wasn't much there. Now, that's the Hebrew word tohu and va is and, Vohu, tohu va vohu, complete and utter chaos. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was complete and utter chaos. And the Spirit of God was over the surface of the deep, the water, the yam. I think at this point, Satan had already thought he had control of the world, rebelled against God, a third of the demons with him, and this was where it was. It was darkness, tohu vavohu, yam, mot. Um, it's, it's the beginning. And yet, John, when he writes chapter 1, he says, the darkness did not prevail against him. Um, Jesus overcame, the light overcame the darkness. And what does God do? Let there be light. Light in the midst of darkness, peace or shalom in the case in the midst of chaos. So, um, so let's continue on then reading in Mark chapter five, because they get the storm calms down. Starting chapter 5, verse 1, and they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. Matthew had him at the Gadarenes, but same story, same witness, two witnesses to the same power of God in the same way. And when they got uh, out of, and when he got out of the boat immediately, a man, you notice it never once says the disciples got out of the boat. I, I mean, maybe they did, but when Jesus got out of the boat, um, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He was dwelling in the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, day and night, he was screaming in the tombs and in the mountains and gnashing himself with stones, and seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouted in a loud voice. I understand that it was common in the Decapolis, at their tombs, if you had uh, buried a loved one in a tomb, tradition said that you should take them food and water and leave it at the tombs in case they're, they their departed spirits might be hungry. And so the people would bring a lot of food and water, so a lot of the homeless then would hang out around the tombs. It's kind of like going into the homeless areas of some cities. And so it's thought that Legion was, had rolled one of the stones away. At night he would sleep in the tomb. Uh, he would go around and eat the food. Um, but he was in a horrible state, and he knew it. And I think the demons that possessed him knew it. And instead of running from the master, the demons knew they had to come. 
and he said, Legion said to uh, the master, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you, do not torment me. In Matthew, the demon said, do, have you come to torment us before our time? The demons know their final destination. And we'll look at that when we close. But their final destination is to be uh, tortured in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever because they are created immortal. They can't be killed, but they can be bound. And scripture tells us that in the days of Noah, certain demons were disobedient and they were sentenced, uh, locked up in what they call the abyss. And that would be a whole nother sermon and we will do that when we get farther into the scriptures. But these demons know that God himself has put restrictions around them. And if you think about that, wouldn't we all be dead right now if God had not placed restrictions around the demonic world? Absolutely, we would be. Because he's the God, the, the Satan is the God of death and destruction and lies and evil and everything that's chaotic in the world. And so God has put these boundaries there. And if the demons cross those, locked up. And they know that. And so they come back and say, and there's torment there. I said, have you come to torment us before our time? And um, he ha had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Uh, but it hadn't happened yet. And he said to him, oh, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. In the Jewish writings of the day, they said that no one could cast out a demon from a man who was both deaf and mute. Because you had to know the demon's name. And once you had the demon's name, you could command him by name to leave the person. It happened rarely and occasionally, uh, but when the master came, it happened every time. And guess what? As we go through the scriptures, you think we might come to a time when there is a deaf and mute man who is demon-possessed? Oh, maybe so. It might have more implication. And so he said, um, what is your name? My name is Legion, for there are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send him out of the, them out of the country. Uh, and Legion, I think, is usually about 6,000 soldiers. Uh, Matthew doesn't give us a number. Um, but there were many. Uh, and now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain, and the demons implored him, saying, Send us into those swine so that we may enter them. And uh, Jesus gave them permission, and Matthew, he says, Go. So once again, who needs permission to do what here? And once again, whose swine are these? What are they going to be sacrificed to? The gods, to to the God of chaos, to the God of death, to the God of, of destruction, or to Baal so that, so that he will overcome all of these things for us. And Jesus is standing here saying, go, go. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. And they became frightened. Now, they had real fear. Those who had seen it described it to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine, and they began to implore him to leave the region. And as he was getting in the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might go with him. And he did not let him, but he said, Go home to your people, report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has mercy on you. And he went away and began proclaiming him in the Decapolis, that awful word that you couldn't say, and what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. Well, 
in about two years more, year one, year two, in the midst of year three, Jesus on the eastern side will feed 5,000 people. Then he'll, men, and then he'll do some other ministry things and he'll go to the western side to the Decapolis and he'll feed 4,000 people. On the eastern side, they had how many baskets left over? 12 for the 12 tribes. On the western side, they had how many baskets left over? Seven for the seven nations. Jesus is the bread of life to all mankind. I know. Isn't it incredible? We didn't even talk about the two fish and the five loaves and those numbers and all of that. But we'll get to that. It'll be fun. And so you're starting to see the big picture. Well, 1 Corinthians 15.50 says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet of God will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable have put on the imperishable, and this mortal have put on the immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So the last enemies that are going to be destroyed are death and the grave. And so, did I not put, okay. I left out that in Revelation, I don't have my notes. The end of Revelation, it says that death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. Now, Hades is the Old Testament equivalent of Sheol, which is often used for grave. So it's possible that Jesus was saying death and the grave are going to go in the lake of fire because it's never going to happen again. There's not going to be any death and there's not going to be any graves. And... Um, Peter had denied the master three times. Weren't you one of them? No, I don't know him. Weren't you with him? No. I saw you with him. Wasn't me. And then what did he hear? The crow, the cock crow, and he made eye contact with the master as they were leading the master away to be crucified. And I can imagine the torment that Peter was under for the next 10 days before the master met him in the Galilee. And they were fishing, and they had fished all night, and they caught no fish. And they see this guy on the shore with a fire going on a burning coals. And as we've talked about, that's symbolic of the presence of God. So there he is on the shore, and Peter sees him, and Peter's been tormented by his denial, by the things he's done, by the things that has happened. And he jumps in the yam, and he goes to the master. He doesn't care about the water. And the master asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? Then take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, Peter. Do you love me? Three times. Yes, Master, I love you. Take care of the sheep. And he says, your name shall is Peter. It means rock. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, perhaps the grave, will not prevail against you. Death and the grave are destroyed. Chaos is destroyed. Yom is destroyed. All the pagan gods that were demonic are destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire where they will be tormented forever and ever. So there will be justice. There will be shalom brought back to the world. Um, do you remember, just I'll close on this slide, 
Jesus said in Luke, if by the finger of God demons are cast out, you know that the kingdom of heaven is here. There's only one other reference, two other references to the finger of God. One is writing on the Ten Commandments. God wrote them with his finger. And the other is Pharaoh. Pharaoh talks about the finger of God creating these plagues and these miracles. You know if demons are cast out that the kingdom of heaven is here. It has been, it is now, and it is to come. So I guess the question is, this week, last week, next week, what? What are our storms? What is the God of chaos doing? What is the power of God? You guys talked about Gideon this morning. Gideon was up against 10, 20,000 Midianites. This was certain perishing. This was certain death. This was certain chaos. This was not good. And God took all of his men and pared it down to 300. 300 is the numerical value of Ruach Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And the Ruach Elohim was hovering over the surface of the water. It's the power of God. And the power of God meant Gideon and it only took 300 men, and all they had to do was break some pitchers and scream, and the Midianites were wiped out. And that's another picture of God destroying chaos and death and uncertainty in our world. And then we worry, lay awake at night worrying about our chaos. Lord, I'm in the midst of all this chaos. My favorite horse died. My family is in splinters. My friend won't talk to me, my other friend won't meet with me to make resolution, my wife and I had words, I'm in this storm, so whatever your storm is, what is your chaos, Jesus crossed all the way across the sea to the place where no Jew would go to meet with one person and redeemed him. And he cares that much about each of us and he wants to come and meet us and calm our storm. Jesus said, both God and Jesus said, God said in Psalms, Jesus said in the Gospels, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And that's the calm I want in my life. I want the kind of fear of Lord that I am in awe of him and I see his miracles and I have to be closer to him and I have to be in his presence and I have to know how he's working and I want to walk there every single day I want to be able to sleep at night in a storm. I want to not be worried about chaos and perishing. I want the finger of God to be writing my story on my stones. In Revelation, it says at the end of time, there will be no more sea. And we read Revelation and we think, oh, there's just going to be all land on the earth. There'll be no more sea. The word is yom. There will be no more yom because yom gets destroyed. Yom is chaos and tohu vavohu. And there'll be no more death because death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. That's where we're going. I don't know. I, I find comfort in that because I love the ocean. And my wife really loves the ocean because you see the power of God in that and the magnificent. Are you going to tell me in the world to come there'll be no ocean? That's not what the verse is saying. There'll be no more chaos. So it's okay to buy that house by the ocean in the world to come. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The last chapter hasn't been written yet. This week you're going to encounter chaos. But the master who has control over all chaos and all demons and everything that's wrong in the world will cross through that storm just to meet you, just to reach down and pick you up. And the end of the story is this. After that legion went, Jesus said, go and tell your people what God's done for you. 
after the crucifixion, the ascension into heaven, the disciples began to go out. And do you know where the strongest churches were built in the first 10 to 20 years after Messiah? In the Decapolis region. The disciples in 70 AD fled Jerusalem before the destruction. They went to the Decapolis where the church was established and where they would be protected and taken care of because Yom was gone, Mot was gone, and God was going to form his church. And so I think that when God calms our storms, takes care of our demons, we have stories to tell. We've all been there. We've all come through it. Tell the story. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for opening our eyes to the incredible links and ties and geography and scripture. And I know we've only seen a portion of them. Lord, help us to sleep well this week in the storms of life, to realize that storms and chaos will not be the norm forever. That in the kingdom of God, you come, you meet us, you calm our storms, you cast out our demons, you heal us, you clothe us, you feed us. I don't know where the, the clothes came for Legion. Maybe Jesus gave his own coat. But Lord, you care that much about us. I pray that you empower us to walk and be testimony to you this week and to enjoy the magnificence and awe of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.